Hello, uh, welcome to CSC Colloquium. Uh, today we have Radhika Mittal, who is a PhD student at UC Berkeley. She's been working with uh, Sylvia Ratnasamy and Scott Schenker for the last few years, and she's been working on network protocols for both for the wide area as well as for the data center, and also looking at some uh, interesting fundamental questions with respect to network protocols as well as how to make them deploy in practice. Uh, some of her work is actually running inside of the Google data centers, and she'll tell us all about her work soon. Okay, thanks for the intro, Arvind. Uh, so hi everyone, today I'm going to talk about how we can have a more stable network infrastructure, and I'll explain what I mean by this. So all of our day-to-day -day applications run over computer networks, both across the wide data internet and within data centers. And this has resulted in an increased emphasis on network performance. We get really frustrated when our web page does not load fast enough or when there are glitches in our video streaming. And this network performance also has a big impact on revenues generated by online service providers such as Google, Amazon, Netflix, and so on. And as a result, there have been many recent proposals to change the network infrastructure in order to meet different performance requirements. Uh, where by changing the network infrastructure, I mean changing the hardware equipments from which the network is built as our requirements change. Such proposals include various scheduling policies to having network support for congestion control, and more recently, even making the network lossless. And there are multiple such examples. And while these solutions are intellectually brilliant, they are often too difficult to deploy in practice. Since they often require hardware changes, you can imagine how difficult that would be given the scale of the network. Also, the history of internet has shown us that our performance requirements change frequently as the usage model changes. So even if I do end up deploying a specific solution now, what do I do when the requirement changes? It would take me five to 10 years to deploy a new solution, and by then the requirement may change again. How do we keep up with this? And even if a solution requires making only software changes to the network infrastructure, that too is difficult to deploy at such a large scale, and it greatly complicates network management. So what do we do? We cannot constantly keep updating our network infrastructure, but we do want to meet our different performance objectives. So is there a way to meet these different performance objectives without constantly changing the network infrastructure? And that is a question that my work tries to address. Can we have a stable network infrastructure that can be used to meet our different performance objectives without the need to constantly update it. And for this, uh, my work proposes a more principled approach for finding solutions to meet different performance objectives that is based on two questions. The first question is, can we altogether avoid changing the network infrastructure? And what I mean by this is, rather than having solutions that may make changes inside the network, can we instead have solutions that only change the endpoints? So we are basically removing the intelligence or complexity from inside the network and moving it to the endpoints that are much easier to update. And this basically echoes the classical end-to-end -end principle in system design and is clearly the best design choice for our goal of having a more stable network infrastructure. But there are multiple factors that affect network performance. And while we can avoid infrastructure changes for some of these factors, there are some others, for example, packet scheduling, where we do need some infrastructure support. So the second question is that for such cases, where we do need to change the infrastructure, can we make our changes universal in nature? And what I mean by this is, rather than having specific solutions for specific requirements deployed inside the network, can we instead have a single fixed universal solution that we deploy inside the network once, which can simultaneously meet all of our different performance requirements? And even if we cannot satisfy this goal of having a completely universal solution that can meet all of our, common, all of our performance requirements, even having a, an almost universal solution that can meet most of our common performance requirements is also a big step towards a more stable network infrastructure. So these are the two questions that I looked at for this goal. First, can we avoid changing the network infrastructure by looking for solutions that only change the endpoints? And second, when we do need to change the net network infrastructure, can we look for universal or almost universal solutions that can simultaneously meet many different performance requirements? Now, an alternative to having universality is this upcoming notion of programmable networking hardware. And some of you might be wondering, how is the notion of universality that I'm proposing different from this notion of programmability? So let me try to explain what I think is the distinction between the two. Programmability implies having a single hardware that can be used to express multiple algorithms, which in turn can be used to meet multiple goals. And this obviously is a big improvement over the status quo of having specialized hardware for specialized requirements. But universality is something even stronger in that it implies having a single algorithm that of course runs on a single hardware, which in turn can be used to meet multiple goals. 
So with programmability, as our requirements change, we would still need to go and reprogram all of our networking hardware in a large scale network. And it also makes it much more difficult to reason about the network behavior. But with universality, we can have a truly stable network infrastructure, both fixed hardware and software. And what does a stable network infrastructure imply? It means that we don't need to touch the, hard, the network equipments, no need to change them or even go and reconfigure them as our requirements change. It makes it much more simpler to manage the network. And as already established by seminal works in networking, it's much easier to reason about such a network which stays predictable or constant and leads to a predictable network behavior. Okay. So these are the two questions that I looked at for this goal of having a more stable network infrastructure. And in the context of the first question, I proposed end host based solutions to replace complex network support for wide area congestion control, for data center congestion control, for the recent paradigm of deploying RDMA within data centers, and for achieving near optimal average flow completion times in data centers. And I'll briefly talk about some of these works towards the end of my talk. What I'm going to focus on mostly today is the work I did in the context of the second question, where I explored if we can have a universal packet scheduling algorithm, which can mimic all other algorithms. All other scheduling algorithms, of course. Okay, uh, but before diving into the details of my work, let me start with discussing some of the relevant background, describing some, some of the terminologies that I'll be using throughout in my talk, the key factors that affect network performance, and the two classes of algorithms that influence these factors. So let's start with considering this very simplified network model, where Alice wants to send some data to Bob over the computer network. Now the networking stack in Alice's computer, or what we call the end host, splits, splits up this data into multiple packets. And packets that belong to the same connection make up a flow. Now every packet contains the packet payload, which is a segment of data that Alice wants to send to Bob, and it also contains the packet header. So packet header basically carries all, the, all of the metadata that is required by the network to process and forward the packet. Uh, so you can think of these packet headers as being analogous to the envelopes in which you put our letters. They contain the source and the destination address, the packet sequence number, and so on. So do remember this term header. I'll be using it extensively in my talk later. Now the network comprises of interconnected nodes that we call switches that forward the packet along an appropriate route to the destination. Now let us zoom in at a particular switch to see how it handles the incoming packets in order to understand what factors affect network performance. So consider these packets coming in at close succession at a particular switch. Now the switch can only forward one packet at a time at the rate that is de determined by the bandwidth of its outgoing link. So what happens to the rest of the packets that come in at the switch? All switches maintain a buffer in which these rest of the packets get queued up. And then when the buffer becomes full, a packet gets dropped. Now, both the queuing delay, which is the amount of time that the packet ends up waiting in these switch buffer queues, and the frequency of packet drops are the key factors that affect network performance. And there are two classes of algorithms that influence these factors. The first class of algorithms is called scheduling algorithms, which run inside these network switches, and they decide the order in which packets get served by these network switches. So this could be as simple as first in, first out, or we may want to do round robin across flows to emulate fair queuing, or we, 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 may, we may want to prioritize some packets over others. So here all of the red packets are being prioritized over the blue, over the green. And this priority value can be carried in the packet headers. And there are multiple such examples of scheduling algorithms. So what they basically do is they decide how the total queuing delay gets shared between different packets that come in at the switch. The second class of algorithms that affects network performance is congestion control algorithms that run at the end host and they decide the rate at which packets are sent into the network by these end hosts. So they're basically deciding the frequency of packet drops and the total que queuing that gets built up into the network. So my work has looked at both scheduling and congestion control algorithms, but as I mentioned before, in this talk, I'll mostly be focusing on my work on scheduling algorithms. So with this little background, let us now try to uh, answer whether we can have a universal packet scheduling algorithm. So as I just, just, as I just mentioned, scheduling algorithms play a key role in determining network performance. And so over the years, our community has developed many different scheduling algorithms to meet many different goals in many different contexts. And these scheduling algorithms need to be implemented in the switch hardware to keep up with the high bandwidth requirements. So how do we support different scheduling algorithms for different requirements? One option is to change the switch hardware every time we come up with a new algorithm, but it's hard to spin out new ASICs and it's especially hard to do so at such a large scale. Another option is to use the recently proposed programmable scheduling hardware 
But as I mentioned before, this still requires us to go and reprogram all of the networking switches in a large scale network. And the kind of programmability that it needs does not exist today. And what's driving both of these options is this underlying assumption that we need different scheduling algorithms for different requirements, which leads us to ask this question. With our work, we instead ask a different question. Do we really need different scheduling algorithms for different requirements? Or can we instead have a universal packet scheduling algorithm, which is what we call a UPS, that is a single algorithm that can meet different performance requirements. Now the first question that arises is, how can a single algorithm produce different outputs that are needed to meet different requirements? So to understand this, let us go back to our network model where we saw how the network is made up of interconnected switches and endpoints. Now the hardware switches inside the network collectively make up the network core, while the endpoints can be more broadly defined to include the network stack at the end host, uh, even the software switches at the edge of an autonomous system, the hypervisors and data centers, and so on. These endpoint devices collectively make up the network edge, which acts as packet ingress and egress points. Now for a large variety of reasons, it is by now a very well established assumption that the software network edge is much more flexible than the network core, in that it's much easier to update the network edge than to update the network core. So with this model, let us consider some input traffic coming in at the network ingress, which traverses the core of the network, where the switches are running some scheduling algorithm, many of which may rely on some optional header initialization that, ha that can happen at the ingress. So what this means is that when packets come in at the network ingress, we can put some value in the packet header that gets used by the scheduling algorithm in making its scheduling decision. For example, we can put some priority value in the packet header that then gets used by a priority scheduling algorithm running in the network core. And this is optional, not all scheduling algorithms need this. We then see the resulting output at the network egress. Now according to the conventional mindset, the output traffic characteristics are tied to the scheduling algorithm that is running in the network core along with the optional header initialization. So for example, if our objective is to minimize the average flow completion time, we would emulate something like shortest job first by running priority scheduling inside the network core with the headers carrying the priority value that depict the flow size. But if our objective is fairness, we would unfair queuing inside the network core and for this we do not need any specific header initialization. But if the objective is weighted fairness, we would unweight it fair queuing inside the network code with headers now carrying the flow weights. And we can come up with other such examples. So with this conventional paradigm, in order to meet different desired performance objectives, we're changing both the header initialization at the network edge, which is optional, but more importantly, we're changing the scheduling algorithm that runs inside the network core. And since there is such a tight coupling between the scheduling algorithm in the network core and the performance objective that it's, that it's helping us achieve, it's hard to envision a universal solution. However, in a quest for universality, we envision tying the output traffic characteristics solely to the header initialization process with the code running a fixed scheduling algorithm, which is completely agnostic of the desired output, and it simply makes uniform scheduling decision using the packet header state. So you can think of this header initialization process as being analogous to passing different parameter values to a fixed function to get different desired outputs. So with this paradigm, in order to get different desired performance objectives, we just change the header initialization at the network edge, keeping the scheduling algorithm fixed in the network core. So notice that we're changing the mental model here from figuring out the appropriate scheduling algorithm that needs to run in the core to meet a desired performance objective to figuring out the appropriate header initialization that needs to happen at the network edge. And this paradigm is much easier to deploy than the conventional one, because as per the assumption I stated before, it's much easier to update the network edge than to update the network core. Uh, so the main focus of my work here is to intellectually examine whether we can actually have such a fixed scheduling algorithm in the network core, given some paradigm with some edge core split. And this is our main practical question. Can we really have a fixed scheduling algorithm that we run inside the network core that we can just initialize differently from the edge of the network to meet any given performance objective? And this is the goal that I started off with. But notice that we wanted to meet any given performance objective, even futuristic one. How would we know and evaluate such a thing? Even if I do end up coming up with a solution that meets all currently known objectives, 
how to pack it in a confidence that it would meet all, fu all futuristic ones as well. This required a more precise definition of universality, which led us to the following theoretical question. Can we have a fixed scheduling algorithm in the network core that we just initialize differently at the network edge to reproduce a given set of packet output times that gets generated by any other arbitrary scheduling algorithm? So packet output times is basically the time when a packet exits the network and reaches the egress. And if I'm able to reproduce the set of packet output times that is generated by other arbitrary scheduling algorithms, I'm essentially mimicking that arbitrary scheduling algorithm. So for example, if my network, if the switches in my network is running fair queuing and I see some packet output times, those packet output times would satisfy the goal of fairness as per fair queuing. Now if these packet output times are given to me as input, can I use them to initialize my packet headers to reproduce the same output times? If I'm able to do so, I'll be uh, mimicking fair queuing and achieving the goal of fairness. Uh, I'll uh, describe uh, this question a bit more formally a bit later and I'll, and I'll also explain why it's a hard problem. But notice that this is not very practical since we do not know such packet output times in advance. But it's important because it gives us a very precise definition of universality allowing us to understand its fundamental limitations and which algorithms are flexible enough to be universal. So this basically gives us two viewpoints for universality. The theoretical viewpoint where we ask if we can reproduce a given set of packet output times in order to mimic other arbitrary scheduling algorithms. And the practical viewpoint where we ask if we can achieve a given performance objective. And since there's a direct mapping between the packet output times and the performance objective that they help us achieve, we can say that if a theoretical solution exists, it gives us hope that maybe we can also use it in, use it in practice to achieve different network-wide objectives. But if a theoretical solution does not exist, then maybe we cannot have a practical UPS either. So with this framework, let us first start with answering the theoretical question. Can we reproduce a given set of packet output times? So let me begin with describing this question a bit more formally. Okay. So for this, let us again consider a network model where we have some uh, topology, some input workload, and we have some arbitrary set of scheduling algorithms running inside the switches many of which we rely on some optional header initialization. We then see the resulting output timings at the egress. So an output timing is basically the timestamp when the packet exits the network and reaches the egress. And we denote this as OP for a packet P. This set of output times, OP, is what we call the original schedule that we are trying to reproduce or replay. I'd like to point out that we allow a very broad view of scheduling algorithms when creating this original schedule. We can have two different switches running two different algorithms. They may rely on various kinds of state, consult an oracle, have omniscient knowledge, or whatever. The only requirement that we have from this original schedule, from the set of output times OP, is that these output times must be viable in the sense that there must be some way to schedule the incoming packets inside the network such that we get the corresponding output times. We then try to reproduce or replay this schedule given to us in the form of the original output time OP. And for this, we use the same topology, of course, and the same input workload. And we also assume every packet follows the same path in this replay as in the original schedule. But we now run a candidate UPS inside the network core, and we initialize the header for every packet using the output times OP from the original schedule. This gives us a new set of output times at the egress for the replay that we denote as O prime P for a packet P. And we say that the replay is successful if for every packet P, O prime P is less than or equal to OP. So we require that the replay does no worse uh, for a packet than the original schedule. Notice that this is not a very exact reproduction of the original schedule, but if this condition is satisfied, we can just hold the packet at the egress until the output time OP elapses, leading to an exact reproduction. Now the main question here is whether we can actually have such a UPS that can perfectly replay any given schedule under all scenarios. And the seemingly simple question is rather hard. And what makes it hard is the pragmatic constraints that we add on a UPS. The first constraint is when initializing the header for a packet P, the ingress can only use the output time and the path information for that packet P and it should remain oblivious to the rest of the packets in the network. And the second, 
And the second constraint is uh, when making its scheduling decision, the UPS can only use the packet header state and some static information pertaining to the network topology, such as the link capacities. We call this constraint model black box initialization. Maybe you could explain a little bit more mm -hmm. about why the constraint on O prime P is one-sided. Like you were just saying that it should be only less than. Less than or equal to. Yeah, so basically, uh, uh, so we want to reproduce the original schedule, and if it's less than or equal to O of P, then we can just hold the packet at the egress until output time OP elapses. So that seemed like a natural constraint on, on the output times. So it, it was kind of more intuitive that way. Yeah, I wonder whether there would be some extreme point where you didn't have to have any schedule at all, but you would still be like, constrained. Like, mm -hmm. I guess the point would be that you could pick, you could just pick some schedule that was meaningless that right. you know all the op all the prime p were were zero for example uh, okay like that, that no so basically so trivial. yeah basically we have this constraint that the o ops that we want to reproduce must be viable and then we want o prime p to be less than or equal to op because uh, we would uh, yeah basically it would hardly be the case where some application would say that oh you know i really want i want i want the packet to come after this certain time you mostly want the packet to come before a certain time so that that's what led to the less than or equal to constraint yeah okay so we call this black box initialization now an extreme alternative to having black box initialization is omniscient initialization uh, where we allow the header initialization process, process at the ingress to use extensive knowledge about when every packet was scheduled by every switch in the original schedule. But this omniscient initialization is not very pragmatic. So what makes black box initialization so pragmatic? Well, by enabling the constraints of black box initialization, the key source of impracticality that remains in our theoretical model is the knowledge of these output times OP. But this can be thought of as a desired output time for a packet that would help us achieve a given objective. And I'll talk about how to estimate it later when discussing the practical viewpoint. But for the purpose of this theoretical viewpoint, we assume that this output time OP gets generated from some original schedule that we're trying to mimic and it's given to us. Okay. Now, before moving on to the results, uh, let me try to explain why this is a hard problem. Now, some of you might be thinking that I already have the output times that I want given to me as input. Isn't it not just trivial to replace schedules? Well, indeed it is trivial if the network only has one switch. We can then just prioritize the packets based on the output times that we want, and that will help us reproduce the original schedule. But the network actually comprises of multiple switches, and we can have one set of packet interact one set of packets interacting with different sets of packets and different switches. This leads to a very complex dynamics which makes this problem rather hard but also very interesting. And this is what is reflected in our basic results. I can show that there always exists a UPS under the omniscient initialization model where we allow the header initialization, initialization process to use extensive knowledge about when every packet was scheduled by every switch in the original schedule. But since we have this per switch packet output time, this basically boils down to the, to the trivial single switch case, and it's therefore not a very surprising result. But interestingly, we can show that we can never have a UPS, that we can never perfectly replay all schedules under the black box initialization model, where only the final output times at the egress is given. This is where the uh, complex dynamics due to multiple switches kicks in, which not only makes the problem hard, it actually makes it impossible. So given this impossibility result, we then try to explore how close can we get to achieving universality. And uh, as per our intuition, our theoretical analysis also suggests that the difficulty of replaying schedules depends on the number of congestion points that a packet sees in its path. So congestion point is nothing but a switch where, uh, where the packet can experience some queuing and the scheduling algorithm kicks in. While we can show that there's a scheduling algorithm that can replay all schedules having up to two congestion points per packet, we can prove that no scheduling algorithm can replay all schedules having three or more congestion points per packet. So this gives us an upper bound in terms of the number of congestion points that a scheduling algorithm can handle. So the next question is, can we achieve this upper bound? And the answer, of course, is yes. Least slack time first algorithm, or LSTF, can indeed achieve this upper bound. So what is LSTF? 
LST has been well known in the real time systems community for process scheduling. So how do we use it in networking for packet scheduling? So with LSTF, uh, every packet uh, header carries a slack value that indicates the maximum possible queuing delay that the packet is willing to tolerate in the network. So for the purpose of replay, it, it is initialized to the queuing delay that the packet saw in the original schedule that we're trying to reproduce, which can be computed from its output time and some information about its path. Then as the name suggests, the switches schedule the packets with the least slack time first, and it additionally update the, updates the slack of every packet that it's, that it's scheduling by subtracting the queuing delay that the packet sees at that switch. We can prove that LSTF can replay all schedules having up to two congestion points per packet. And like any other algorithm, it can fail to replace schedules having three or more congestion points. And it's not that all algorithms are capable of achieving this upper bound. For example, simple priority scheduling that we thought of as a most natural choice for doing a replay can only replace schedules having up to one congestion point per packet, and it fails beyond that. So what makes LSTF so much more stronger than priority scheduling? Well, it's because the switches kind of subtract the queuing delay that the packet sees at that switch. It allows the uh, packet to maintain some history of how much queuing it has already seen versus how much more it can tolerate, which, which makes LSTF more stronger. So these theoretical results establish that LSTF is as close to achieving universality as any algorithm can get. But they do not give us any concrete measure of this closeness to universality. In fact, when I have three or more congestion points, I can orchestrate a scenario where I can make the replay performance of LSTF arbitrarily bad, but still bounded by the number of packets. But this scenario needs to be very carefully orchestrated, and it's unlikely to occur in realistic settings. So we then try to explore how well LSTF performs empirically uh, under different realistic settings. So for this, we do some NS2 simulations. Um, so the first step is to create an original schedule. So we take some topology, some realistic workload, and we run some set of scheduling algorithms inside a topology, and we get some output times. And we then do the LSTF replay. So we take the same topology, the same input workload, and we now run LSTF in, inside our uh, switches, uh, and uh, we compute the slack based on the output times from the original schedule. And we com then compare the resulting LSTF replay output times with the original schedule. And we find that across different experiments that we try, a less than th or in general, less than 3% packets miss the target output times. And of these, less than 0.1% packets are late by more than one transmission time. Uh, so what this means is that of the packets that do end up getting late, most of them are late by statistically insignificant amounts. And that too because the schedule is non-preemptive. So I'd also like to point out that uh, our setting here did have more than two congestion points. There were like between like one to 10 uh, congestion points. Uh, if you go and measure uh, how many points were congested. Uh, okay. And uh, we tried this across a wide variety of original scheduling algorithms, common ones such as FIFO, fair queuing, shortest job first, even arbitrary ones such as last and first out, completely random scheduling, half of the switches doing FIFO, other half doing fair queuing, a switch doing FIFO for half of its traffic, fair queuing for the other half, and other such combinations. And we also tried a wide variety of experimental settings, changing the network load, the bandwidth, the topology, status and the topology, wide data topology, and so on. And our results across all of these settings show that LSTF is empirically almost universal. Yes, sir. Uh, just a, a, one question, which is that, um, and maybe you're getting to it later in the talk, which hmm. is that you kind of said that there's a th theoretical question, and right. then there's the practical aspect of, OK, now I'm going to try to emulate FIFO, or, uh, right, try right. to emulate fair queuing or something like right, that. Right. And it seems like the one knob that you still have is setting the slacks right, right. When, you, when, you, when you start. Yeah. Um, are you going to say a bit about how you would try yeah. to emulate one of those? Yeah, that, is it coming, is that's, it coming in it the future? It is coming, yeah. OK. Uh, in two, three slides, yeah. OK. Uh, related question to the, um, uh, sorry, a different mm -hmm. question. Um, so you said that uh, how, does, how do those numbers change? Um, like you said, basically, you had 3% misses and one per point. As you change the uh, number of congestion points that you have in the network, um, uh -huh. uh, do, do you have some? Uh, As I change the number of congestion points, actually, that's a good question, and I don't have data on that because I just tried like different settings, and like overall, there could be scenarios where I saw two congestion points or three congestion points. I just these are just aggregate numbers. Specifically, how do they change? As I change the congestion points, I don't have data on that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Okay. So to summarize the theoretical viewpoint, uh, we evaluate a candidate UPS by its ability to replay a schedule that is given to us in the form of the final output times at the egress. 
our theoretical results show that while we cannot have a UPS under the pragmatic black box initialization model, the classically slack time first algorithm comes as close to achieving universality as possible. And empirical results show that LSQ is empirically almost universal. So now that we have an almost universal theoretical solution, it gives us hope that maybe we can also use LSTF in practice to achieve different network wide objectives. So let us now see how we can use LSTF to achieve different objectives. Uh, so the main source of difference here lies in how we initialize the slack value. With the theoretical viewpoint, we had the knowledge of the output times from some original schedule that we're trying to mimic in, that we used to initialize the slack value. But such knowledge of packet output times is typically not available to us in practice. So we now look at the network wide objective that we want to achieve and we come up with certain heuristics for assigning slacks for achieving that objective. And as I'll discuss a bit later, the main source of constraint here is whether we have enough information at the edge of the network to compute the slack based on different heuristics. But as I now show, we can indeed uh, compute the slack to achieve different flow level and packet level performance objectives. And for this, I look at three very different performance objective functions, uh, minimizing tail packet delays, minimizing average flow completion times, and achieving per flow fairness. So for evaluation, we compare the results obtained using LSTF for each of these objectives with a state of the art algorithm known for optimizing that objective. So let us start with looking at, looking at each of these objectives one by one. So let's start with minimizing tail packet delays. So to minimize tail packet delays, we simply assign the same slack to all of the packets. This makes LSTF identical to a scheme called FIFO plus, which has been shown to be optimal to minimize tail packet delays in multi-hop networks. And it performs uh, significantly better than FIFO, which is what is widely deployed today. To minimize average flow completion time, a slack assignment heuristic tries to emulate Schotter's job first, where the slack assigned to a packet is proportional to the size of the flow to which the packet belongs. We compare this with both Schotter's job first and its close cousin SRPT along with FIFO. And our results across different settings show that LSTF performs comparable to both Schotter's job first and SRPT while being better than FIFO. To achieve poor flow fairness, a slack assignment heuristic tries to, uh, is inspired by virtual clocks, uh, uh, which is this algorithm that was proposed like many years ago. And uh, so for this, um, the first packet of the flow is assigned the slack of zero, and the slack of uh, uh, every subsequent packet is updated based on some estimate of the fair share rate and the interarrival time between the packets. Uh, we compare this with the state of the art fair queuing and we find that we can get eventual convergence to fairness for long lived flows and even for short lived flows we can get flow completion times that are roughly comparable to fair queuing. Uh, so this shows how we can achieve different flow level and packet level objectives with LSTF. But there are a number of uh, interesting extensions to this practical viewpoint and I'll just discuss one of them here. So I showed how we can achieve individual network wide objectives with LSTF. But the network may actually comprise of multiple traffic classes, each wanting to optimize on their own performance objective. And in today's world, without a universal solution, a switch would need to support different scheduling algorithms for each of these different traffic classes, which is hard to do. But the UPS or LSTF makes this a lot easier. We can use the existing infrastructure support to isolate these different traffic classes. This can be done by using dedicated links or the round drop in support between fixed traffic classes. And we can then use LSTF within each of these traffic classes to achieve different performance objectives. Notice that, uh, Erwin had a question. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm going back a couple of slides for this. Um, in fact, one slide each. Okay. Um, uh, Should so, I go back? Uh, you could. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So if you go back to the fair queuing slide, uh -huh. um, it seems like you basically uh, want an estimate of the fair share rate. And that's not something which you might have access to right. uh, before and it's a function of the uh, topology function of the traffic right. workloads and so on and so forth. Right. Is it some kind of a, like a running estimate that you're keeping on the, on, on the end host which kind of, uh, which you kind of somehow plug into it and then actually yeah. generate? Yeah, so basically this estimate, even a very rough estimate, like some notion of like, okay, what the traffic matrix is versus like what the link capacities is like that can actually give you like a very rough estimate that and that is good enough to get a good performance and the better the estimate is the better the performance is and like in fact like uh, like it can be actually like we can kind of explore it more in the future in some sense like how do we more precisely get the fair share rate so even but even if we are like kind of up to like 
5x or for 4x, or we still get good performance. Critical question, which is that right. you know, for a, maybe in a controlled data center setting, hmm. where um, you know you can imagine that this is possible, whether you can actually achieve this. Uh, right. So, like, for example, can use like sort of SDN and stuff to kind of just kind of monitor sample packets every now and then and look at the number of flows in the switch. And like, there have been a lot of work around network monitoring that ah, we can correct. use to. So you can imagine that. even sending a packet pair initially or something and and looking at. The yeah, there has been like a lot of work. I mean, like sort of. Uh, using some of these tools and forgetting the name SNMP uh, and things like that to kind of uh, get the get some estimate yeah. okay and then uh, going back to the previous slide yeah um, uh, you uh, you it seemed like here um, you were having the slack assignment be in one dimension which is left flow size which right. is in, the, in 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 terms of bytes right. Uh, what's happening inside of the network is that the slack is being reduced in terms of time. Right. So how does these two kind of... So basically, you, we can uh, actually make the difference in the slack large enough that like even if we kind of... Uh, so basically, if we have like one flow with just one packet and one flow with 10 packets, we can make the difference in the slack large enough that this one packet flow will always get higher priority over the 10 packet flow. So it's uh, it's basically like uh, basically bytes times some k which is large enough. Uh, so it. even if we kind of have small reduction in time, we can still get that prioritization effect that we want. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we can then uh, sort of use existing infrastructure support to isolate different traffic classes if they each have different objectives and use LSTF within each of these traffic classes. Uh, notice that we cannot use LSTF itself to isolate these different traffic classes based on fairness. And this is where the constraint that I mentioned before kicks in, where we do not have enough information to initialize the slack at a particular edge. So what I mean by this is like if if, that, if, the, if I have a packet arriving uh, belonging to a particular class at a, partic at a particular ingress, then the slack that needs to be assigned to that packet would depend upon packet of the same class arriving at some other ingress. And if these two ingress points don't communicate with one another, we don't have the right information available to us. But if these traffic classes, classes are separated using some notion of prioritization, that can be done using LSTF. And in either case, LSTF makes it a lot easier to handle this case of uh, supporting different objectives or different traffic classes much easier than the status quo. So to summarize, uh, we discuss universality of packet scheduling using two viewpoints, theoretical and practical. Our theoretical results show that uh, while we cannot have a UPS under the pragmatic black box initialization model, the classical least slack time first algorithm comes as close to achieving universality as possible, and empirically LSTF is almost universal. We then show how LSTF can be used in practice to achieve a variety of flow level and packet level performance objectives, and it also makes it easier to handle the multiple traffic classes case. So work implies that we might not need many different scheduling algorithms, and we can instead just use LSTF uh, with varying initializations. Uh, uh, so can you comment uh, a little bit about the, um, I don't know, the hardware complexity of implementing LSTF in the... Okay, yeah. Is it, or if that's coming then? Uh, no, it's not actually coming up, but I have a backup slide on it. I'm wondering if I should pull it out. Actually, maybe not. It will kind of disrupt my flow. I, I mean, just informally. Yeah. yeah. So basically, uh, uh, so what LSTF needs is this, it needs it needs this notion of fine-grained prioritization in the switches. Once we have that, then the header manipulation that is needed for LSTF is easy enough to do. Yeah. I mean, for, I yeah. expect it to be, you know, order log n log n of the. Of the yeah. Queue. So it is order n log n. So of, there are like the queue the, packets, or are you mm -hmm. approximating it in some way. Yeah, so there have been like different proposals. For example, like many years ago, there was proposals on like pipeline heap to do like fine grained prioritization, and that can be used for deep buffers. It can, can kind of scale very well to deeper buffers. And then more recently, there has been this work on Pi4 push in first out queue that came out of MIT, which, which can be used for shallow buffers that uses some sort of a bucket sort algorithm to optimize this. So there has been work on like how to do fine grain prioritization that we can just build upon that an LSTF. Once we have that support, LSTF only needs like sort of some header manipulations that can be easily done on top of that. Yeah, I guess so, the other, another related question is, uh, Given the trend towards uh, networks being operated with essentially zero queuing happening uh -huh. in the network, um, does that uh, obviate the need for this? Does it, um, 
like if you were successful at getting zero queuing, then presumably there wouldn't be any any purchase. If they were successful in getting zero queuing, I think it's zero queuing is hard to achieve because there's always a trade off between the utilization of your network versus building a queue. So if we actually kind of go towards a zero queue network, we may end up kind of utilizing uh, the utilization levels may not be that high. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry, keep keep going. Yeah. Uh, uh, should I keep going? Okay. Okay. <laughs> the, no, you can. You can. You can ask. Okay. They, the, uh, so one of the, uh, you know, a version of that question is since right. you are allowing for information, to collected information. I mean, in your scheme, to uh -huh. be able to uh, figure out what the, um, uh, the clock times are to put on uh, the, right. the least uh, times to put on the packets. You're allowing inf or, or accounting on information being flowing from the network back into the end. Points, right? That is, you're like part of the model is that you're assuming that there is this possibility of gathering information about workload and then using that to kind of guide the decision. So not at a very fine-grained kind of level. No, I understand. Yeah, you're not yeah. doing it on fine-grained level. Right, but right. Less, so you, like zero you queuing, are, for example, would require like a more fine-grained information. Well, well I mean, like, uh, and more like a centralized control kind of a thing. It would have like sort of some latency and scalability concerns also. So it does seem. Uh, well, okay, so you could argue that um, how how frequently I have to gather information about the, what's right. happening in the network right. uh, could be um, uh, uh, that you would, by having LSTF in the network, I would be able to be more resilient to longer it, delays. Right, exactly. Or, and so right. they get, they, I mean, they, they could kind of coexist. We can try to achieve zero queuing, but we may not actually be able to achieve exactly zero queuing, and they're like having some notion of scheduling inside the network would help out and LSTF and zero queuing approaches can coexist in some sense. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yesha? So uh, in the long term, you could imagine a world where you have programmable network hardware, uh -huh. well network infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Are you betting against that happening or would what you, whatever you're saying be useful even in that world? I think it will be useful. So what I'm saying is that like we should try to come up with as universal like we should try to make infrastructure as universal as possible and that can help us somewhat guide like what features need to be programmable versus what is not. So as I mentioned, like we can't really have like a universal packet scheduling algorithm. There are some limitations to it. So that's where like uh, programmability can kick in where okay, this is the limits of universality and this is the thing that I need to make programmable. So even if we do have a programmable uh, programmable switches, there are like still constraints on the resources that would be there on the switches and sort of having this a notion of like, okay, this is what really needs to be programmable versus this is what we can make universal can help out there. So the two can coexist in that way. Yeah. Um, uh, so going back to the uh, PIFO kind of uh, related yeah. um, way of thinking about it. Um, so the reason why you would need PIFO is that um, essentially you enqueue a packet which is let's say a lower priority and then you enqueue something which is higher priority right. uh, in terms of slack times and right. you want to reorder it. Right. But suppose if you don't worry about doing that reordering, but uh -huh. just at the point of enqueuing time decide on the priority, right. which would be an approximation of LSTF, right. how would that perform? Uh, so actually, so we are actually deciding the priority at the enqueue time itself. and like. LST, if it, you can think of it as a limitation, you can think of it as a nice property. It's sort of once you enqueue a packet, the priority ordering would not change, and okay. that's what PIFO provides you. But yes, like if there are like some ways to approximate that to reduce the cost of implementation, that would be very interesting to explore in the future. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, okay, there are a number of open questions that do remain about this work. So from a more theoretical perspective, I showed that LSTF uh, can achieve the universality upper bound of handling two condition points per packet. But is it the only algorithm that can achieve the universality upper bound? So I'd like to point out here that there is another way of implementing LSTF that uses an earliest deadline first based approach, but it requires a switches to maintain some additional state and LSTF has a cleaner implementation model. But we can prove that LSTF is equivalent to this ADF based approach. But is there some other algorithm that does not belong to the same equivalence class that can also achieve the universality upper bound? I intuitively feel that the answer is no, but I don't yet have a formal proof for it. From a more practical perspective, can we describe the class of performance objectives that LSTF cannot meet in practice? So as I mentioned before, I believe the main source of constraint here would be what information is available or not available to us at the edge. So I showed how LSTF can meet different flow level and packet level performance objectives, but it cannot achieve class-based fairness because of this limitation. 
So can we describe this class of objectives more formally and do something about that? Okay. So this concludes my discussion on how, on how we can have an almost universal packet scheduling algorithm. But scheduling is just one of the many factors that affects network performance. And since these scheduling algorithms need to be implemented in the switches, it motivated me to look for a universal solution. But there are a number of other factors that affect network performance, for example, congestion control. And there have been a lot of proposals to add various forms of infrastructure support for these other factors. So let us now see whether we need that uh, explicit switch support or can we instead have solutions that only change the endpoints. Now for each of the four scenarios that I looked at here, our community had proposed point solutions based on the assumption that explicit switch support is needed, either in the form of some new complex mechanism in the switches or in the form of careful tuning and reconfigurations inside the switches. The assumption for the wide area uh, congestion control was that switches need to explicitly signal the sending rates in order to fully utilize the link capacity. The status quo for data center networks is that switches need to explicitly mark congestion in order to keep the queuing delay small. More recently, we have this paradigm of RDMA, where we assume complex with support to make the network lossless. And in general, for minimizing average flow completion times in data centers, our community had proposed a number of uh, different schemes requiring various forms of switch support, such as rate signaling, and marking, or complex scheduling, with no clear understanding of what is needed. So my work in this context questions these assumptions and shows that we can instead restrict our changes to the endpoints and use the existing network infrastructure support, which can enable similar and often better performance without changing the network infrastructure. Now, in the interest of time, I'll very briefly discuss just the first three pieces of work here, starting with my work on wide area congestion control. So any congestion control mechanism has two main goals. The first goal is to fully utilize the link capacity or to fill the pipe in order to get high throughput. And the second goal is to not harm the other flows that are sharing the network as we are trying to fill the pipe. And these two goals conflict with one another. The first one requires us to be more aggressive, and the second one requires us to be more cautious. And traditional approaches have tried to achieve these two conflicting goals using the single mechanism of finding the right sending rate. And since we do not know what other flows are sharing the network, widely deployed TCP, for example, cautiously probes for the sending rate until it can fully utilize the link capacity. But this cautious probing leads to a large amount of wasted capacity in this initial process. And so there have been a number of proposals uh, to quickly find the sending rate and uh, get rid of this wasted capacity by using complex switch support. So what these proposals require is, is they require the switches to compute the sending rate based on what flows are coming in and then put the sending rate in the packet headers that the end host can then use to uh, send. And there are multiple examples of proposals that use the same basic idea. And such proposals are difficult to deploy, requiring significant changes to the switches and complex state management. With RC3, rather than relying on the single mechanism of finding the right sending rate, we simply decouple these two conflicting goals by using fixed priority queues, the support for which is already present in most switches. Uh, so what this decoupling does is uh, we send additional packets aggressively, but we send them at a lower priority. So this allows us to fully utilize the link capacity. But since the additional packets are being sent at a lower priority, we do no, no harm to the regular traffic, which is being sent at a higher priority. So this is a very simple decoupling that requires only about 100 lines uh, of changes to the Linux kernel, and it results in 40 to 80% reduction in flow completion time over regular TCP, while performing better than competing schemes that do require, does require complex with support. Okay. So with RC3, we show that we do not need the switches to explicitly signal the sending rate, and we can instead just use uh, decouple our conflicting goals using uh, simple priority scheduling. With this, let us move over to my work on data center congestion control. So any all congestion control mechanisms run a feedback loop, and they require some signal from the network to detect congestion. And round trip time, or RTT, is a very natural signal to do so, because it gives us a precise amount of queuing delay that a packet sees in the network. However, RTT was discarded as a congestion signal for data centers because it was considered to be too hard to measure it accurately. And so ECN, or explicit congestion notification, emerged as a de facto choice. So with ECN, switches are required to mark the packets when the queuing exceeds a certain threshold. And this threshold needs to be very carefully configured to keep the queuing delay small while the throughput high. But timely, we show that accurate RTT measurements are possible using in today's data centers. 
and we demonstrate the goodness of using RTT as a congestion signal in that it's a completely end-to-end -end signal requiring absolutely no switch support and it's also more informative than a single bit ECN markings. We therefore we thus developed Timely, which is the first RTT based data center congestion control scheme and we show how it achieves low latency while achieving near optimal throughput. And Timely is currently being used for a significant fraction of Google's intra data center traffic. So with Timely we show that we do not need the switches to mark the packets to keep the queuing delay small and we can instead uh, use RTT which is a completely end to end signal. Okay, so finally, let us discuss uh, the network support needed for deploying RTMA. In these last few years, we are seeing this new trend in data centers where people are moving away from the traditional TCP IP networking stack towards using RDMA or remote direct memory access. So with RDMA, uh, network functionality such as packetization, reliability, and so on are, are all offloaded to uh, hardware NICs that allows the service to achieve negligible CPU utilization, ultra low latency, and high throughput, all of which are highly desirable properties in today's data centers. And ROC, your RDMA over converged Ethernet, has emerged as a canonical means for deploying RDMA in these data centers. And it's widely believed that ROC needs a lossless network to get good performance. And so the network is made lossless by enabling priority flow control or PFC. PFC is basically this pushback mechanism where the switches pause their upstream entities from sending more data when the queuing exceeds a certain threshold. And this threshold again needs to be very carefully configured to uh, avoid packet drops while keeping the throughput high. And experiences with PFC deployment have shown how it greatly complicates network management and it also leads to a number of performance issues such as unfairness, congestion spreading and even network deadlocks. And as a result, our community is now actively trying to fix all of these PFC issues and in the process we are adding even more complexity inside the network. So with this work we took a step back and we asked, do we really need a lossless network to deploy RDMA? And we find that the answer is no. And by making straightforward changes to the Rocky end host design, the NIC design, we can enable 6 to 83% better performance without a lossless network. So not only are we eliminating the requirement for losslessness, we are improving the performance in the process. Uh, as we synthesize the design, targeting an FPGA device supported as a bump on a wire on a recent RDM enabled NIC, and the synthesis results show that our design is well within the limits of feasibility, adding only a modest overhead of, of about 4%. And I've also had very detailed discussion about this design with commercial NIC vendors such as Intel and Mellanox, uh, ensuring this is something that they can very easily implement. And inspired by our results, Mellanox is considering implementing a version of our design in their next release. So with IRM, we show that we do not need a lossless network to deploy RDMA, and we can instead just update the endpoints. So this concludes my discussion on, how, on my first steps towards having a more stable network infrastructure that is based on these two questions. First, can we avoid changing the network infrastructure? And if not, can we look for universal solutions? And I showed examples of how we can do so in the context of congestion control and packet scheduling. But I believe that this line of reasoning can be applied much more broadly. For example, can we use the framework of universality that I developed to end the age-old debate about uh, whether the network edge is sufficient and how much more core support do we need? I showed that maybe for scheduling and congestion control, it might be sufficient to restrict the intelligence to the edge of the network. But what, what about other network functionalities such as monitoring or load balancing or specialized, route, specialized routing? How much more core support do we need? And more than just the edge versus core argument, I believe that this line of reasoning can be applied more broadly to other systems related, related problems as well. For example, uh, can we use this line of uh, reasoning to uh, help us guide in what network stack functionality at a particular end host should get offloaded to hardware? Now, RDMA is an extreme example where we are offloading all of the network stack functionalities to hardware. And while hardware gives us speed, we end up compromising on flexibility and resource availability for that. So the analogous questions in that context would be, can we avoid offloading a functionality to hardware? Would implementing it in software help us meet our performance guarantees? And if not, if we do need to offload a functionality to hardware, then can we come up with universal primitives for doing so that can handle different upper layer requirements of different upper layer applications? Now, before I end, um, the work I presented today was done in collaboration with many people, both from academia and industry. And I would like to thank all of them, in particular my advisors, Sylvia and Scott. And with this, I'm happy to take any more questions that you may have. Thank you. Paul.
So with the universal uh, packet scheduling, you said, well, if you've got three congestions, yeah. sort of all bets are off, you can't yeah. handle that in general. But that's with a very uh, strong requirement that you, are, you would at least achieve the same timing. Yeah. If you relax the question to some level of approximation on the timings where certain things are a, a little bit longer, does it change uh, the, the result about mm, universal? No, so basically, depending on like how the packets arrive, I can make the the delta in the sense like how late I am, I can make that to be arbitrarily long, but that's still bounded by the number of packets. There could be some results where we say that as long as it's within like k times n, where n is the number of packets in the network, there could be some bounds with respect to the number of packets, but they can't, I, I, I can prove that there's no constant bound on the lateness. Any other questions? Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker. Okay.